Hello, Culpepper. You guys can do better than that. Hello, Culpepper. Hi, I'm Roscoe Jones. I'm Abigail Spanberger's Chief of Staff, and welcome uh, to your town hall. We're thrilled to have all of you here to really participate in our democracy and to ask questions of your uh, elected member of Congress. Let me give you a quick run of the show for tonight. Uh, we're going to start off with a Pledge of Allegiance uh, from a local girl, two local Girl Scout troops that are here in attendance. And then I'm going to give you some quick uh, ground rules about tonight, and then we're going to hear from Abigail. Uh, and then after that, it is your time. Uh, your time to ask any questions that you like uh, to Abigail. So that's going to be the run of the show for tonight. Again, welcome. Glad to have you all here. If you haven't had a chance to get a ticket, we're trying to do this in the most equitable and fair way for questions. Uh, Christy, right here to my left and your right, actually has a jar where you can go and you can pick up a ticket. We're going to put part of that ticket in the jar and we're going to randomly call on about uh, several different people to stand up right here to my left in the aisle way. We'll have a microphone there for you and you can ask uh, questions of your congresswoman uh, yourself. So we want to do that. We want to make sure that uh, we try to get to as many people as we can tonight. So I ask that you please keep your questions a little short so we can get through as many people as we can uh, and enjoy tonight. And without further ado, here's Abigail. Thank you so much for being here. I really, truly appreciate it. This is our eighth countywide town hall. Uh, since I was sworn into office in January, we were just in Chesterfield on Sunday, and we'll be in Powhatan on Saturday. So we've got a, uh, a grouping of them right now. We've also done coffee with your congressperson in a couple of our counties, including one in Culpeper. We've been adding those to the calendar whenever we know we're going to be in town and have some extra time. Um, I'm really appreciative to all of our team members who are here. We have people from the DC office and people from our Henrico and Spotsylvania offices. I hope you'll have a chance to meet some of them afterwards. And we are trying some new things in order to make sure that we are really making uh, the best effort possible to have variety in the individuals who get to ask questions and to make sure that we can get through as many as possible. Um, Roscoe asked for your questions to be short. What he didn't say is my answers should also be short. I am usually the problem when it comes to this sort of thing. I wanna just start out for a couple minutes and talk about what's been happening in Washington. There's a lot of conversation, a lot of you know, going on in the news about what is happening and isn't happening. And I will say this, there is a lot of hard work happening on Capitol Hill. There is a lot of engagement happening on Capitol Hill. There are a lot of people who are focused on solving and addressing the issues that are impacting people's lives, be they here in the 7th District of Virginia or Michigan or Texas or California. And I have found many incredible colleagues who are focused on so many of the issues that I am focused on. The job of a member of Congress, I look at it in three buckets, three primary buckets. And the first being constituent services. It's usually the, the least talked about aspect of things, but our office is here to help you. Our office is here to be a resource for people throughout our district and to ensure that you are getting what you need. Uh, Karen is our district director, and there she's back there. Karen is our district director, and she leads a team of people who are engaged in the community, attending events, and helping constituents with any challenges they may be facing with federal agencies. So we have helped. Um, at this point, we've opened more than 400 cases, and we've closed, I think, more than 200. And what that represents is that means a veteran who is able to get his or her benefits. That means someone who was having trouble with the Social Security Administration, ensuring that they were able to get their correct benefits. It is. Um, someone who has some questions about Medicare being able to ask those questions of us and have us help them get answers. So I'm very, very proud of that. The second piece of the job is the legislative piece. And so I have been focused since day one on addressing legislative issues that are important to people here in Central Virginia. And the two big, big buckets that I have spent the, a tremendous amount of time on have been prescription drug pricing. Healthcare is the number one issue that I heard about or was the number one issue that I heard about uh, before I was elected and, and sworn in. And prescription drug pricing is really the tangible piece of that that impacts people's life no matter who you are, where you live, every single day. And so what I've done on that front is I have uh, worked with a bipartisan group to focus on um, creating bipartisan and bicameral solutions. So I've worked with a group uh, of Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate to focus on 
pursuing bills that will pass the House and pass the Senate and ultimately have a chance of, of getting signed uh, by the President. I have myself introduced a bill focused on transparency. Um, our group has looked at the challenges facing our healthcare system and prescription drug pricing and said, you know, we can agree, this group of senators and House members and Republicans and Democrats, we can agree that we need affordable prescriptions, that we need transparency in our prescription drug pricing, and that we need competition in our prescription drug pricing. And so the bill that I introduced is a bill that would bring greater transparency to the pharmacy benefit managers, which are the, um, the middleman organization between the pharmaceutical companies and the, uh, the pharmacies. There's a lot of rebates and discounts and vouchers that, that are often used with PBMs, and there's no transparency to it. So the goal of my bill is that through transparency, we have a better understanding of what those invoices and vouchers do, whether or not they in fact do impact pricing, as many, many believe that they do. Um, and this isn't an extra hurdle or anything for the PBMs because it is information they already have to provide to the federal government. We're just asking that it also be made public so that there is transparency for people in our communities to understand the pricing mechanisms and perhaps some of the challenges that create, um, uh, that, that drive up prices. The second thing I have been very focused on has been broadband internet. We have 10 counties in the 7th District, and seven of them have solid broadband issues. Uh, Spotsylvania has troubles as well as Chesterfield. Um, as many of you are Culpeper residents, I do not have to tell you about the problems created by lack of broadband access. It is an economic issue. It creates challenges for what businesses can come to our community. It is a healthcare issue. It keeps veterans from being able to use telehealth. Uh, facilities. It is an educational issue. We have kids who don't have the same access to the same sort of homework opportunities or study opportunities. And overall, I think it is a it, it is signaling a divide between communities that have easy access and communities that don't. When we're trying to attract businesses to Central Virginia, and one county has great access and another and the next one doesn't, it is creating a. a, a it is creating an added challenge and a lack of competitiveness that I think is, is hurting us. I think it's a regional issue uh, for those of us in the 7th District. I live in Henrico County where we don't have challenges, but I talk about this issue just as much in Henrico as I do anywhere else because I think we need to understand that every one of our counties will stand to benefit when we have greater connectivity. And what I've actually, what I've actually done on that front is I led, during the appropriation season, I led a letter with one of my colleagues, a Republican from Illinois, determining that the ReConnect program, which is a USDA program meant to provide grant money and funding to localities, uh, that that program was a useful program, it's a valuable program, and we requested, this colleague of mine, that that program be fully funded. We then went out and got 70, uh, more than 70 of our colleagues to agree with us to sign off on our letter, and we had people from South Dakota to South Carolina join us, fully bipartisan letter, recognizing that broadband internet is access to it is an issue that impacts communities across our country, though predominantly more rural communities. Then, when we actually were getting to the point where we were doing appropriations, so just this past month, I led an amendment that would provide an additional $55 million to the ReConnect program. This program that I just talked about, for every $3 that were applied for, there was only $1 available. So the 55 million won't solve the problem, but when we look at it as an economic investment, it is so vital that we take this step. My, my amendment uh, to the appropriations bill actually got a floor vote, and it got more than 400 votes. So in the House, there's not a lot that gets 400 people to agree on anything, so I was very, very proud of that. That passed the House, we are waiting for it to pass the Senate. It is my hope that when the House and Senate go to conference to make sure that their bills line up, that my amendment and my piece stay in. I think it's incredibly important to our communities. And then the third and final piece of my job in Washington is related to oversight. I serve on the Agriculture Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm the chair of the Conservation and Forestry Committee, which means I um, am leading the effort at oversight of the conservation title. That is not nearly as exciting as some of the other or controversial as some of the other oversight activities happening in Washington, but it is an important element of my constitutional duty as a member of Congress. As a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I am also ensuring that our members of the Foreign Service have the resources that they need to do their job, to keep us safe, to contribute in the way that they do on a daily basis to our national security. And when there are challenges that I think are worrisome, I stand up for uh, the Constitution. And a specific example that's made it in the news a bit 
is the administration declared uh, an, uh, an emergency circumstance in which they asserted they needed to sell a variety of uh, military weapons, including paveway missiles uh, among them, to the Saudi government uh, for its hostilities in Yemen. And the simple process should be that the administration comes before Congress and we have 30 days to approve or deny uh, the, the sale that they choose, that they have proposed. Because of this emergency declaration, they were trying to circumvent uh, Congress and by extension, the constitutional responsibility that we have. And so I led uh, an, a resolution within the House of Representatives, ultimately there were four, and I co-sponsored the other three, that would say, that spoke to the fact that this is not constitutional, that we object to this sale, and that we believe that the, the administration needs to come before Congress for any one of these sales as outlined in the Constitution. Ultimately, it was the Senate version of my resolution that passed, um, as well as two others. And uh, the president ultimately did veto those, but I, was, I am proud of the effort that we have made as we continue to stand up for um, the Constitution and the role that Congress should have. The other issue that I'm very passionate about is the issue related to the 2001 authorized use of military force. After 9-11, we put the authorized use of military force in place, and it has been very concerning to me that the AUMF from 2001 has been used to authorize um, active military hostilities in a variety of different countries throughout the world. It is my opinion that if we are going to send service members off to war, every member of Congress should be on the hook for a vote. And we should not, no matter who is in the administration, because now we are on our third administration with the same AUMF, that whoever is in the White House and whoever is in Congress, that they need to take that hard position and debate the, the role that Congress has and they need to debate before they send people's children and spouses and family members and parents off to war. And I feel very, very strongly about that. And in our defense appropriations bill, we affirmed that the 2001 AUMF should not have any relevance to a potential hostilities that we may or may not engage with in Iran. Um, and so those are the three pieces of what I've been working on, and I will stop there and begin the questions. Thank you. Um, I'm Jeffrey Nickel, I'm from Culpeper County, and my question is, so as a rising junior in high school, I soon will be applying to and attending college. What do you intend to do to help ease the burden of, of paying for college on low-income and middle-class families? Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, so one of the top issues that we talk about in Congress is how to contend with issues of college affordability. I am a member of a group called Future Forum, which is relatively younger members of Congress um, who are focused on issues of truly younger Americans. And uh, one of the issues that we are focused on is college affordability. Uh, I don't have to tell you this, but affording college or going to college and then coming out with debt impacts the decisions that our young people are able to make, uh, be it from buying a car to buying a house to moving where they want uh, to starting a business. And it is incredibly challenging to recognize the amount of debt that so many people go into. Um, so there's been a, a couple different things that, that we've talked about. One is um, in, in initiatives related to um, college affordability. And one is ensuring that people can negotiate uh, their, renegotiate their college loans. The fact that you know, I can go out and renegotiate my mortgage, but you can't go out and renegotiate your student loan is a significant challenge. Um, I am a believer that we need to have highly competitive, low rate, uh, low interest rate um, uh, loans for students to go to school so that they can take out the loans that they need. Um, we also see a lot of success with some of the dual degree programs for young people who start their college studies when they are in high school and transfer those credits over. That's not necessarily a strong place for the federal government to play a role, but when we look at um, federal loans that do exist for lower income students, making sure that those dollars are available at any point in your school education I think is incredibly important. Um, another thing that we have made efforts uh, that we've moved forward with is making sure that Pell Grants are available year round for students who are Pell eligible to be able to take summer school because it isn't just the tuition that costs so much, it's 
it's supporting yourself, it's having an apartment, it's living where you live, and so, so frequently students take out loans to cover those aspects as well. Um, and if we are able to um, allow students to study year-round, the, the associated costs with being in college um, continue to go down in that case. Um, so it's, it's a complementary effort, um, and I don't think that there's one single solitary um, challenge. One of the things that I do think is important is that we recognize the value of community colleges, and here in Culpeper we have a great example in Germana, um, and, and learn from the issues, uh, learn from the example of affordability that we've seen with community colleges, and make sure that students who are in high school who do want to have dual degree or dual track programs can achieve those before potentially um, moving on to a four-year institution. Good evening. Um, thank you for your service, Congresswoman. Um, my name is Susan Ralston, and I live in Culpeper County. And you may know that Culpeper County and other counties in your district, Page, Chesterfield, Spotsylvania, are, are these rural counties in Virginia are really struggling with solar developers who are trying to install solar power plants on agricultural land. In Culpeper County, there are um, two pending projects, almost 3,000 acres. And one of the things that makes rural land attractive to out-of-state or international developers is the tax credits and subsidies for renewable energy. Taxpayers are essentially funding this industry, making electricity overall more expensive. The U.S. Treasury estimates that the production track tax credit for wind and solar will cost the taxpayers $40 billion from 2018 to 2027, making it the most expensive energy subsidy under current tax law. Congress is again looking to extend these tax credits this cycle. So when this legislation comes up, will you vote to renew these tax credits? As I mentioned, I serve on the Agriculture Committee. I also am chair of the Conservation and Forestry Committee. So some of the associated challenges, like we saw in Spotsylvania, where there was a tremendous amount of deforestation in order to put in the solar panels, um, is concerning to me from the perspective of, of you know, my focus on the forestry side of my subcommittee. Uh, I also believe that we need to transition and encourage renewable energy uh, across this country. And we need to get to a point where we are relying on renewable energy, or at least um, that renewable energy is contributing far more to our energy output. There's a couple elements of things we, we need in tandem to work on, which is better um, electrical infrastructure when we talk about the infrastructure projects that may or may not be coming down the pipeline. Part of that needs to be modernizing our electrical grid when we're talking about environmental issues and wasted energy um, and, and how we can move towards renewable. Part of that discussion has to be in modernizing the electrical grid. Part of that discussion also needs to be focused on um, strengthening our battery power, our ability to, to conserve the energy that is actually produced by solar and wind. Um, I personally have solar panels on my house. I am a believer in renewable energy. Um, and I'm not sure of the particular piece of legislation that you are talking about. Um, so I would review each piece of legislation um, individually. But overall, I do support federal, um, federal incentives to grow our renewable energy throughout the country. Good evening. I'm Donna DeAngelis from Riva, Virginia in Culpeper County, and I'd like to know what plans are in place for oversight of the conditions in detention facilities at the border. Monies have been approved to improve those conditions, and I'd like to know how Congress intends to make sure that they're spent for that purpose and what plans there are currently to unite the families that have been separated. Thank you, Donna. I recently went to the border and visited a variety of three different facilities. I visited a facility where individuals are initially being processed 
for their asylum claim. I visited another facility, a detention uh, facility for families, uh, and each of them were very, very different. The second facility that I visited was a soft-sided, temporary structure. It was very clean, but it was cold and it was austere. I visited another facility that was older and it had it was essentially like a jail and they were holding families and individuals there. And then I visited a fourth facility, which was a long-term uh, center for unaccompanied teenagers. Uh, this one was for teenage boys. So these are young men who had crossed the border and not been separated from family members, but had crossed the border by themselves and were being um, detained there until they could be reunited. So I'll start with their, their circumstance first because it's the most direct. Um, what, what I saw and what I witnessed and what I know to be true is that our um, HHS system is working very hard to try and unite unaccompanied minors with family members who are already here in the United States. One of the challenges that is presented with that effort, particularly in this heightened time of, of real partisanship around the issue of immigration, is that some of the families who may not have legal status are a little bit slower concerned to come forward. That has added to the complications of trying to unite these children with family members. Um, I heard success stories where they were able to find a family member in Louisiana or Texas relatively quickly, confirm that that individual was a family member, and return that child to a family member. Um, there are also stories, and I met young men who were at this facility for close to a year, still waiting to be united with family members. Um, this particular facility was meant to hold children for longer. The boys I met there were 13 to 17 or 13 to 18. Um, they were in classes, they had dorm-like facilities, they played a lot of soccer. I had the chance to speak to the young boys. Um, and while their circumstances are really, really challenging, the majority of the boys, well, any of the boys I spoke to, um, and I was given easy access to talk to whoever I wanted, um, generally expressed a hopefulness about getting united with family members. Not all of them, notably, were from uh, Central American countries. There were some young men who had come over from Bangladesh as well and crossed the southern border. Um, and, and so the, this particular facility was attending to their medical needs. And, um, and I, while it isn't an easy process, that is probably the most straightforward when it comes to reunification. As it relates to our current policy, our current policy is if a child crosses with a parent or a grandparent, they stay together. If they cross with someone else who is not a parent or a grandparent, that is not considered, or, or a legal guardian with documentation, um, they are detaining those individuals separately. And these are the horrifying stories that we've seen because there are aunts and uncles who are crossing with children and being separated from them. Um, we, on, in the House of Representatives, are working on legislation that would redefine what is a family unit um, to ensure that when someone crosses with an aunt or an uncle that they are able to stay together. Um, and, but there are still, according to oversight numbers, there are hundreds of children who are still looking to get reunited. Some of them may have been children who crossed alone, and some of them are children who did not come with a direct family member. When I was at one of the detention facilities, there were three little girls who had arrived unconnected to adults. They had arrived in a large group of people, and there were no adults who accounted as their parents. Um, and these little girls were all under 10, and the process of trying to find who their families are um, is something that I don't, that is such a challenge for our law enforcement agents to, to undertake. I don't know what the result there will be. Um, there have been greater efforts to track children. They were walking us through the process from an oversight perspective of how the children are identified when they come in with family members, how everyone is, is tracked through the system. Um, one of the concerns that I personally had is you have small children, even when they are there with a parent, there are a lot of parents, there are a lot of children. Um, there are no identification bracelets. I have three children of my own, and you know, s over a six month period of time, they look different. Uh, when you were in the hospital, when we've had, one of them had surgery, we all walked in, we all got bracelets to identify. Um, and so I found it a bit troubling that in some of these larger facilities where there are a lot of children and a lot of parents, um, that they are not necessarily um, given bracelets as they would be in a hospital. Um, we passed a bill last week uh, sponsored by Raul Ruiz, who is a physician uh, and a member of Congress. He's an emergency room physician that would require and set forth the standards of care 
that we should expect of any detention facility. So any person in the custody of uh, the United States government, what that detention uh, standard should be. It's a good bill, it's a strong bill. Um, and he created this bill in coordination with uh, physicians who work for CBP attending to the needs of individuals crossing the border. Um, I don't know how soon that bill will get a vote in, in the Senate, if at all. The supplemental funding bill that we passed three weeks ago, I believe it was, uh, provided additional funding to uh, NGOs who are assisting at the border, additional funding for food, for health care, uh, also for um, infrastructure and, um, and, and facilities um, on, the, on the CBP side of, because um, there's uh, Customs and Border Patrol, ICE, and HHS that are all involved um, in the care of detained individuals. And um, in that bill, it stated that we, as members of Congress and any oversight, would have um, relatively straightforward access to those facilities. Um, as a matter of policy, typically, Customs and Border Patrol doesn't ask that we that no individual takes photos for privacy issues. But when I was there, they said this is our policy, but we do not want to, you know, we'll do whatever it is that you would like. Uh, we were given relatively unfettered access uh, to the facility. I spoke to anyone I wanted to speak to. I'm a Spanish speaker, so I spoke in Spanish. Um, we are nowhere near solving the crisis. Um, but I do think that because of the increased attention and, and because everyone wants to address it, um, I, I do believe that there's a lot of really good attention and oversight happening as to how it is that we are caring for those who are in our care um, because we have detained them and made that so. Um, so the oversight is happening. It's increasing. Just on Thursday, I believe it was, there was a hearing uh, with HHS officials talking specifically about uh, detention facilities, healthcare provisions, food provision, um, and the issue of child separation. So my colleagues on those committees of jurisdiction are not letting up. And um, I, I think that we have reached a point where the challenge of comprehensive immigration reform is one that across the board, across the spectrum of political ideology or partisanship people are recognizing is real and that we have to actually solve the problem instead of you know, set, uh, try to address it in pieces here and there. Hi, I'm Hunter Rawlings from Orange County, and I want to start by saying I'm really happy you are our representative. <laughs> I mean, really happy. In case that wasn't clear. Um, so my question is um, the following. Uh, to many of us, the relationships now um, on the Hill seem really poisonous. Yeah. And it's depressing for citizens to, to see how bad this is. Could, could you just give us your perspective on this? So, you know, you see it firsthand, I don't. And I'd just be interested in what you'd have to say. I'm really glad you're my constituent. <laughs> Sometimes I, I read the headline in Politico or The Hill and I think, where the heck are these people living? Because this is not where I spend my days. Um, some days I have engagement with some colleagues and I want to sort of you know, hide my head under a pillow for an hour or so. Um, the reality is there are a lot of people who won in districts like this where, and I, there are a lot of people in this room who maybe voted for me. There are a lot of people in this room who didn't vote for me. I have a responsibility to every single person. And in order to understand the people I represent, I have to listen. I have to hear differences of opinion. The same goes for my colleagues. I have colleagues who run the gamut in terms of what their priorities are, what their perspectives are, and how they want to achieve and achieve solutions and address problems. And in order to address those, work with them effectively, I need to listen and I need to try and find common ground. It has been my experience that because there is a nice group of people who spend a lot of time finding common ground on their campaigns, they're continuing to do it when they're in Washington. There are a lot of people, a particular uptick in veterans, new members, particularly on the Democratic caucus side, 
who have been focused on, they, they want to solve problems. They're pragmatic, they want to get work done. Um, I co-sponsored an amendment with Mark Meadows, who's a member of the Freedom Caucus, um, who spent a lot of time in the 7th District, not in support of me last year. Um, but my, my, I make that joke because he and I have joked that we don't agree on much, but where we can agree, we'll find that agreement. So we co-sponsored an amendment focused on cracking down on child exploitation um, and, and, and images of child exploitation. We disagree on 10 different things. If we agree on the 11th, that's where we'll work on things together. I also joined a group called the Problem Solvers Caucus. It's half Democrats, half Republicans. It's like a Noah's Ark thing. You have to join with somebody from the other party. And we meet a minimum of once a week. It is really, truly the best hour of my week because I sit with people who run the gamut of what their thoughts are and what their priorities are. And we talk about how it is that we can work together. We talk about the things we disagree on. And we try and at least um, understand each other's perspectives. And usually, that's all that it takes, frankly, is to have a civil conversation. Now, there's also a lot of fighting on Twitter, which I find to be utterly unprofessional and unproductive. Um, but I am focused on working with people who, if they want to have an argument with me, it's a face-to-face -face argument. Um, but if we want to try and find common ground, that's a face-to-face -face discussion as well. Um, so I, I think that the vast majority of what's happening on Capitol Hill is, is, is indicative of an overall desire to get back to a functioning state. I think that the value of a two-party system is we're supposed to have this push and pull of ideas. And we've reached a place where it has become a bit too dysfunctional. But there are a lot of us who see value in that push and pull of ideas and are trying to center ourselves back there. My name is Peggy Kenny. I'm from Culpeper County. And uh, I didn't prepare a question, but um, I am curious as to if the House decides to, you know, study impeachment, what would be, what, where, where are you in that, and what, what do you think? Chesterfield got to that question much faster than Culpepper. <laughs> so a couple updates on all that's been happening in the news related to this conversation point. We actually had a member of Congress introduce articles of impeachment uh, based on the president's history of racist remarks. And that was tabled by the full house. Uh, and I voted to table um, those articles of impeachment because the constitution is clear, impeachable offenses, bribery, treason, high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, so a lot of my answer depends fully on whatever articles are uh, put forth and whatever evidence is given to support those articles. Um, right now, we are at a place where the Judiciary Committee has taken the next step in its investigation. It has requested the grand jury material, which is the underlying information behind the Mueller report. Uh, Mueller report's a very long summary, but the grand jury information is what they requested on Friday, and they did so, and in their court filings, uh, mentioned that they may be requesting that information for potential consideration towards impeachment. Um, my opinion and stance has long been that I believe in facts and evidence, um, and that does not change in this circumstance. Um, wherever we are going, I don't think it's appropriate for me as a lawmaker to have a predetermined destination. Um, I am not serving on any of the committees of jurisdiction. I am, of course, as an American and as a member of Congress, following everything very closely. Um, but as long as the investigations are continuing and we, are, we see my colleagues are continuing to gather information, I am watching very closely. I have read the Mueller report. I am now listening to it on podcast, um, which I recommend. It's actually really interesting um, to listen to it after having read it. Um, but uh, I am all about ensuring that if we are to take a step one way or the other, that we do it based on facts and evidence, um, and that we can demonstrate to the American people that we are not making any decisions based on politics, and we are making every decision, whichever way it is, based on facts and evidence um, and our duty to uphold the Constitution. Hi, Sharon Church from Brandy Station. Uh, transportation in this area is awful, 
And I saw recently in the news there were two senators looking for funding just to fix um, the, the roads and infrastructure. What do we need to do to actually have creative long-term solutions funded? Thank you, Sherry. One of the issues where at the very beginning when I arrived in Congress, we were frequently talking would be a place to find uh, real engagement. We said prescription drugs and infrastructure issues. Um, there were talks between congressional leadership, Senate leadership, and the president related to infrastructure projects. Um, I am in a mem I'm a member of a variety of coalitions. I mentioned the Problem Solvers, which is bipartisan, the New Dems Coalition, and the Blue Dogs Coalition. Um, we have all put out statements, those, each of those coalitions focused on our need to update our infrastructure and what that looks like. Um, from an economic perspective, we have crumbling roads and bridges. We also have a lack of broadband internet uh, infrastructure, and it is incredibly important if we are going to be competitive as a community, as a country, the next 10, 20, 30 years, that we see infrastructure as an investment um, from a national security perspective, when we look at what uh, a competitor like China is doing, where not only are they investing in their own roads and bridges and structures, they're doing it throughout the world. Um, you know, it is really truly uh, in our best interest for us to focus on ensuring that we can um, that we don't face catastrophic results because of a collapse, but also that we be proactive. Um, there was a point in time where I thought we were very close to the administration had agreed with leadership in the Senate and the House about the fact that an infrastructure bill was necessary, a general ballpark dollar amount. Um, it looks as though the parties involved have walked back from that a bit. That hasn't stopped us from talking about it. So anytime I am in a meeting with leadership, um, I talk about prescription drugs and infrastructure um, to make sure and to say this is what my constituents are talking about, so thank you for validating the thing I tell them frequently. Um, because I think it is tremendously vital and you don't just decide to build a road and have it done the next day. This is something that requires advanced planning and a vision. Uh, when we think we recently had you know, the anniversary of sending uh, a man to the moon, we have to have a vision, we have to have a bit of creativity and trying to look towards where are we gonna be 50 years from now. Um, and I think that that is, it is a priority for me. It is a priority for many people, and we are trying to push or pull along people to, to get them on the same page. <clears throat> My name is Dennis Fairhawk, <clears throat> and I'm proud to say that Abigail Spanberger represents me in Congress. <clears throat> in, in 2018, American farmers <clears throat> produced uh, a record corn crop, and on average, American farmers lost $63 per acre in producing that crop. For 2019, corn production is increasing by 4% nationwide. How do we solve this problem of overproduction, uh, underachievement in terms of farmers making a decent wage, and what can Congress and the USDA do about it? How much time do you have? <laughs> so on the Agriculture Committee, the future of our agricultural communities is, is one of our top discussion points. And we, the issues we address are from broadband to healthcare uh, to soil health, because every aspect of pretty much everything comes back to the success of our farmers. When we look at our infrastructure, farmers down in Amelia County, they're one of their largest complaints is the fact that the road infrastructure is so bad that it actually damages their equipment when they're going from field to field on the roads, right? So there's, there's an element of, of everything is the ultimate answer to how we make things better because if the roads are better, they don't have to pay for those repairs, that's money out of their pockets. But a couple primary things. We, we need to look at infrastructure, such as roads, as I mentioned, but, but broadband internet. I have spoken with farmers who have said, there are machines and there are technologies available to me that would allow me to heighten my production, that would allow me to use um, high-tech watering, high-tech fertilizers, uh, fertilizing technology, and I can't use it because I don't have broadband internet. 
So some communities are at a basic disadvantage. And that ultimately, that disadvantage does go back to the pocketbook issues. When I had a round table in the southern portion of our district, the number one issue that people talked about in the southern portion of the district was healthcare. Because at the end of the day, owning a farm is owning a business. And when you are worried about how it is that you're gonna pay for your family's healthcare as you're owning your small family business, that is a significant expense that comes right out of farmers' pockets. Um, I have a co-sponsored a bill that's the Medicare X Choice Act. It's a public option plan that would provide people with the opportunity to buy into a Medicare-like program. Um, by the CBO score, it is neutral in terms of the cost to the federal government. Estimates are it would have a positive impact across the board. More people would be able to buy coverage. It would put downward pressure on prices. Um, and it would bring healthcare to communities where there may not be very many carriers, but there is Medicare because Medicare exists in every uh, zip code. Um, then there's also the issue of trade. So we are seeing for soybean farmers across the 7th district, this is a significant issue. Uh, the administration just announced 16, well, the administration is pursuing $16 billion in, in bailouts or, or dollars to farmers. And every farmer I've talked to, they don't want federal dollars, they wanna be able to sell their products. Um, and the challenges that we are creating by a self-inflicted trade war um, is really detrimental long-term because there are farmers who are losing their market share. And so while we may have support available in a financial sense this year, uh, that doesn't help them regain the market share that they continue to lose the longer we continue to um, pursue a trade war with China. Um, Helping as much as we can. So on our subcommittee, we've done a we've done hearings based on soil health and um, crop cover usage, for example. And so there are new, newer technologies. Some of them are actual technological, and some of them are crop rotation processes or decisions that farmers are making um, that are helping with production. That are lowering input costs because they don't need as much fertilizer, they don't need as much water, um, but ultimately their their output is stronger, their, uh, their, their harvest is better, um, and that is ultimately more dollars in their pocket. Um, so the challenge really exists kind of crop to crop or industry to industry, um, but it, in my opinion, we have to recognize that at the end of the day, a farm is a small business, and those small businesses are impacted a bit more um, than even some of the small businesses, let's say, in the suburban communities by access to healthcare, access to internet, um, and then an overall challenge within uh, the small family farms to, to continue to keep their families in, or their farms and their families. I would add one more thing about uh, the conservation titles and some conservation efforts that have allowed family farms to stay, um, to stay farmed and stay in families, and I'm really proud of the work that uh, we've done under USDA uh, and, and now as the chair of the Conservation and Forestry Subcommittee, looking at some of the ways that family farms have benefited from uh, our conservation title is something that I think um, will continue to help, particularly smaller family farms. Hi, my name's Ed Dunphy and I live in the town of Culpeper and welcome back to Culpeper, Congresswoman. We're really glad to have you here. Thank you so much for listening. You opened your remarks about transparency in prescription drugs, and I have a concern about transparency in the delivery of uh, medical and health care services. I don't know of any other business that I deal with where when I walk in the door, I have to sign away my rights to, uh, it, or, or I have to sign a form that says, I'm willing to pay everything that you charge me for this service, yet I don't know upfront anything about those charges. And so I was wondering what could be done to improve the transparency and health care costs. This is a conversation topic that I have uh, had multiple times, and sometimes the answer you will get is, well, we don't know what services you will need until you are here, we diagnose you, and we start giving different diagnostic tests or different um, interventions. That can't be the end all and be all of a discussion. That can't be um, the only answer that we get back. I've spoken with physicians who have said, well, I actually couldn't answer those questions because when I order 
Uh, my, uh, I've spoken to a cardiologist when I order the echocardiogram, I just don't know how much it costs. And some insurance companies charge one rate, some in insurance companies have a different negotiated rate. And so ultimately the transparency doesn't, isn't lacking just with the patient, it's lacking with the physician. I've spoken to physicians, and maybe there are physicians in the room who've said, you know, I don't know the tests I'm ordering, I don't know how much they cost. Perhaps if they were X amount of dollars and a patient could afford them, are they medically necessary or are they added that I'd like, like a nice to have but not necessary? Um, from how we actually address this, um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I don't have a good answer for that because it would be such a significant shift and I don't know where we would be able to compile all the pricing to make it available. Um, so I will get back to you on that because I'd like to have a better answer for that. Uh, hi, Congresswoman, I'm Rick Ferris uh, from here in Rixieville. Um, very pleased that you're our representative and thank you for all your hard work. My question pertains generally to health care. I'm curious um, how the Democratic Caucus and the House in general is sort of coalescing in terms of solutions to health care. I know there are several different threads or approaches that are being considered, but what, what's, what seems to be the most prominent to you or how, how is all that progressing? Thank you. So the place where everyone is generally in strong agreement is that we need to protect our current health care system. We need to fight the challenges to the ACA. We need to ensure that those who currently get their health care on the exchanges aren't in danger of losing it and that those who are protected under the pre-existing conditions protections provided by the ACA don't see those under threat. That those whose adult children stay on their insurance until they're 26, which is an element of the ACA, continue to have access to that health care. Uh, so the caucus has challenged in court efforts to un upend and undo the ACA. Uh, those challenges continue in courts in Texas and we continue to fight them. We also on the floor have affirmed our belief that pre-existing conditions protections are necessary and vital. That is an area of complete agreement within the Democratic caucus overall. Um, and I, I think we have had some bipartisan support for some of those elements, but I don't miss, I'll speak for the Democratic caucus on that one. Um, in terms of what's next for solutions, another place that people agree relates to prescription drug pricing. Prescription drug prices are too high. Uh, they continue to rise. It is bankrupting people. That is an area of complete agreement. Um, and, and we have uh, passed in the House uh, prescription drug pricing bills pertaining to access to generics, uh, ensuring that there is our limits to patent thicketing, which is when a prescription drug company can change the composition or the delivery of a particular drug in order to extend the patent life past the original patent. There's total agreement on that. When it comes to larger structural changes uh, related to either public option discussions or single payer discussions, that is a place where there's more differences of opinion. I wouldn't necessarily call them divisions. Um, there are many of us who support a public option as a complementary method uh, to ensure uh, our entire community, either through a Medicare X program, uh, through an exchange program, or through an employer-provided program. And then there are some who support a single-payer system, which would be a transition fully and completely. Um, I am very pleased that with the fact that generally that debate exists in a place of debate. Um, and I think we recognize that inherent in our debate is the desire to have everyone in this country uh, have access to health care and not face bankruptcy if they face a significant illness. Um, we argue in our caucus about a variety of different things. The health care argument is, seems to be one that is very grounded in a common goal, which is um, ensuring that people can have the health care that they need. Um, I think there's also a realistic expectation that under the current composition of the Senate and the current composition of the White House, um, that forward movement on, be it uh, uh, a public option or a single payer plan, isn't gonna go into law. And so that is why we are truly, truly focused as a caucus on ensuring that the healthcare advances we have made over the past uh, decade, that those are protected um, in the interim. I suspect the conversation might get a bit boisterous if the 2020 elections significantly change um, the composition of the Senate 
or pretend in the White House. Um, but for right now, we are focused on preserving what we have um, and fighting any chances or any efforts to hurt it. My name's uh, Christopher Bushy. I'm with, in Orange County. Um, as a member of the uh, House Agricultural Committee and chair of the Conservation and Forestry Subcommittee, do you support the use of uh, national lands for the production of energy from utility scale solar, wind, or solar installations? Is there a particular bill that you're focused on? So I am a co-sponsor of a bill that would allow us to strengthen and extend our preservation of certain lands in this particular bill that I've signed on to. It's um, historic battlefields of um, uh, historic battle sites across the United States. Um, I am a supporter of public lands and protecting public lands. Um, and I am unaware of any efforts to, at this time, put um, renewable energy onto public land. So if there's anything in particular you would want to draw my attention to, um, I would make a, a, a determination and an assessment based on, on the circumstances. Uh, good evening, Congresswoman. Uh, my name is Troy Ralston. I live here in Culpeper County in the historic Raccoon Ford area of Culpeper County. And I first want to thank you for your public service. Uh, my wife and others have mildly pushed me into maybe running for a local county office, but to be honest with you, I shy away from it because I know how ugly politics can be, so I admire you uh, for doing it. Um, I do have a question that's on the same subject as uh, two previous questions, actually, so this is apparently a popular subject to address, but I think my question's a little different, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it if you don't mind. Um, you indicate on the issue section of your website that you cherish your time spent outdoors and how lucky we are to have Virginia's m mountains, rivers, and beaches. And I'll add to that our beautiful countrysides, like right here in Culpeper County. You also indicate it's our responsibility to protect these resources for generations to come by investing in renewable energy sources, specifically solar, and also decreasing water pollution. And I agree with you 100%. I, too, am a supporter of solar. In fact, I use it at my farm. But there needs to be a balance. It needs to be done responsibly. So what are your thoughts on a proposed industrial scale solar power plant with almost 400,000 solar panels being installed on nearly 2,000 acres of prime farmland that encompasses historic Civil War battlefields, historic antebellum homes, and many other homes, and land that is right on the Rapidan River, so there's the real threat of toxic runoff into the water supply like what's happening with the coronal solar power plant in, Ex in Essex County. So on your first comment related to politics being ugly, uh, I would urge you to potentially run for office because it's only ugly if we let it be. It only becomes a fight and dirty if we accept that that's the current state of play, and I refuse to accept that that's where we as a nation will continue to be into the future. <laughs> and the more people who enter politics at every level who maintain that thought process, I think the better we will all be for it. Um, yes, related to the issues from my website, I love spending outdoors, our, uh, spending time outdoors. Um, our natural resources are not just beautiful, they are driving our economy here in Virginia, our agricultural economy, they are driving our tourism economy. Um, and I do support renewable energy. And so where I um, really believe there has to be a balance is it should be up to localities to choose what level of engagement is appropriate for the localities, what level of renewable energy investment or lack thereof is appropriate for localities, um, and because it is a local issue in terms of what the land can maintain, what the land and the landscapes um, uh, find appropriate, and from a federal perspective, I do support renewable energy, I do support incentivizing uh, renewable energy, and I do think it's appropriate to leave it up to the localities um, to determine what is best for their local areas. Thank you. 
So I'm going to put down my notebook. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for joining. Um, I realized in answering the One Health Care question that the gentleman asked, he did ask specifically about the Democratic Caucus, and that's something that I can certainly answer as a member of the Democratic Caucus. However, recognizing that there are many constituents um, who uh, may identify in, in other terms, I would say that what I know of what is happening on the other side of the aisle is there seems to be an across a, a general consensus that protecting pre-existing conditions is incredibly important. That's a good thing to see uh, for my colleagues that I work with. Uh, so I, uh, though I can't speak for what's happening in the Republican caucus, I do think it's important to note that that seems to be uh, a newer area of agreement for many of us. Uh, so to close it out, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for engaging in democracy. Uh, this is why I am really proud to represent the 7th District. We just had a town hall in, in Chesterfield County, um, and now we have this one. For me, the goal of what I'm doing is to be accountable to you all. I'm, I'm sure some of you liked some of my answers, some of you didn't like some of my answers, but I hope that you know that I am honest and I am trying to be forthright, and when there's something I don't know the answer to, I'm gonna tell you and try and follow up. Uh, so I thank you for spending your time today here to the Girl Scouts. Thank you for participating. I, I truly appreciate your leadership both here today and in all that you do with the Scouts. Um, and to every person, I, I truly appreciate your time. I thank you for being here. If you ever come to DC, please pop by our office. If you wanna get a tour, please come by our office. If you have further questions that you'd like to follow up with me or with one of our team members, uh, please let us know. And, and I, I'll hearken back to the first thing I talked about, which was constituent services. If you or someone you know has a challenge with the Social Security Administration or veterans benefits or Medicare or the post office, please reach out to us, please let us know. We have team members who are ready and able to help. Um, and if it's not within our purview, don't worry, we will help you find whose purview it is. So please know that we are here to serve you and it is absolutely my pleasure to be your member of Congress. I thank you for your time tonight and I look forward to seeing you at future events.